So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, the first uh, Wednesday seminar of the 2022-2023 academic year. Uh, it's great to see all of you uh, here in person. Uh, it's great we have nibbles uh, in the back um, uh, by popular demand. So if you want to get a quick snack, that's uh, there for you. Um, we have a trick of, terrific lineup this semester. Uh, so uh, please do uh, take a look at uh, our webpage. Um, and we'll have uh, seminars uh, most weeks or a few Wednesdays uh, where we won't um, for a variety of reasons, but uh, it's a great lineup. Um, I'm really uh, delighted today uh, to welcome Professor Lindsay Kahn uh, from uh, the Naval War College. Uh, she's an associate professor in the Department of National Security Affairs for research and publications focused on military organizations and manpower, civil military relations, international law of war, foreign policy and public opinion, among uh, many others. Uh, she received her PhD in political science uh, from Duke University and has held fellowships uh, at the Olin Institute at Harvard, uh, near and dear to many of our hearts, uh, sadly uh, no longer around. Now, the Council of Foreign Relations, uh, where she had an international affairs fellowship, as well as research fellowships from uh, the Humboldt uh, Foundation, the Free University of Berlin, uh, SISIS Center for Transatlantic Relations, and uh, the, I'm not going to pronounce this properly, the Schiftung Weissenschaft und Politik, SWP in um, uh, Berlin. Uh, she speaks widely before uh, military academic and policy audiences, not just in this country, but in Canada, Denmark, France, Germany, Peru, and South Africa. And she's testified before the Virginia National Assembly, the National uh, Commission on Military and National Public Service, and the Senate uh, Armed Foreign Services Committee. Today, she's going to be uh, speaking about public opinion uh, and the use of state course of force. Lindsay, welcome to MIT. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Taylor. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Barry, it's great to see you. Um, Phil, thank you for coming all the way up. Um, I'm really, really grateful for this opportunity to present this work, although um, I recognize that this is a, a seminar and I'd be really happy to talk about how this fits into the larger picture. Um, <laughs> sorry. And um, how this fits into the larger picture um, of public opinion, of concepts of legitimacy of force, um, and also to encourage anyone in this room who is looking for topics to research uh, that this is a great wide open field um, that very few political scientists have actually looked at. Um, in the US context, I should say, there is a lot of very good comparative work on this. Um, the paper I'm going to present is co-authored uh, with two fantastic colleagues, Dr. Jessica Blankshain, who is with me at the Naval War College, and Dr. Danielle Lupton, who is at Colgate. Um, both of whom have a lot of um, interesting recent publications that you might want to look at, also public, uh, focused on public opinion issues. Uh, Dr. Lupton looks at uh, perception of elites, because we know elites and elite framing drives a lot of public opinion. Dr. Blankshain tends to look at um, ideas of legitimacy. She's got a recent uh, paper looking at how perceptions of uh, politicization in the Supreme Court uh, affects how people look at it. Um, but this particular paper came about largely because, what am I supposed to aim this at? There we go. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, this particular paper came about largely because we were all scholars who studied civil military relations on one hand and um, sort of uses of force by states on the other hand. Um, and while uh, I'm not an Americanist, um, uh, and Dr. Lupton is, is IR, and Dr. Blankshain is an Americanist. All of us are familiar with the US case to a certain extent. Uh, and of course, in the year 2020 and then 2021, although we started this project in 2020, there was a lot of stuff going on in terms of uses of the military, uses of the National Guard, proposed uses of the military for domestic policing purposes. Um, and this caused a lot of discussion, right? Um, was it a war on COVID? Should we, can we only mobilize resources when we call something a war? Um, was it appropriate uh, to use the active duty forces in response to protests or domestic unrest? Or should that only be done by police forces, even though police forces in this particular context were highly problematic? Um, should, is the National Guard the answer to these problems? Um, 
and you know we were we were looking at all these um, all these problems and in our particular community there were also more specific civil military relations concerns if you start using the military the active duty forces for these kinds of missions does the public lose trust in them does the public start seeing them as maybe a political tool as though they're not already but you know what i mean uh, do they start seeing them as sort of a partisan tool for putting down these kinds of protests but not those kinds of protests right um so we were really interested to see whether any of this was happening and it turns out that there really is not a lot of research into how the public views the domestic use of the military and for those of you who don't know the domestic use of the military for policing purposes is like my thing that's, that's i'm writing a book on it right now so um, i'm super interested in this and my colleagues were both very interested in public opinion um, and we, we like working together. So we thought, let's try and answer some of these questions. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so a couple of, of big questions that we wanted to find the answers to, right? What are the conditions that influence the level of public support for domestic uses of coercive state power and why? And this was modeled on the international relations literature that looks at public support for the use of the military abroad, right? We, we know a fair, or we think we know a fair amount about why the US public, and most of this looks at the US public, but there, there are um, studies on other countries as well. We know a fair amount about why the US public supports um, military interventions abroad or what types of military interventions they support, right? We know that it's influenced by elite framing, by elite consensus or dissensus. We know that it's influenced by the expectation of success of the mission. We know that it's influenced by perceptions of the legitimacy of the mission, um, a number of other things like that. But we don't know the conditions under which the US public will support uses of coercive force on themselves. Seems like we should find out. Um, and then, sort of we had some ideas about what might matter, um, but there were a lot of them. And what do you do when there are a lot of things that are varying at the same time? You do a conjoint. You do a conjoint um, survey experiment, which is what we did. So we have a number of hypotheses, um, and the things that we thought would matter would be the type of instigating event, number one. So this is the sort of Thinking about um, Gentleson and Britain's uh, principal policy objective framing, thinking that certain types of operations are more legitimate than others, or the public thinks that they are, right? And so in the PPO literature, um, intervention sort of to prevent a state from doing something that everyone recognizes is bad, like invading another state, tends to be seen as very legitimate. But intervening for internal political change, which has uh, a lot of, you know, um, sort of different valence involved, uh, different uh, or disagreement over who's right and who's wrong, that tends to get a lot less support, a lot less legitimacy. And then humanitarian intervention, which is highly legitimate, but only if it's cheap and easy, right? Um, so we modeled some different scenarios on these ideas. We thought the public is probably going to support this kind of intervention when there's a clear sort of traditional threat scenario. Um, and for that, we used a, a threat of a terrorist car bomb, right? Um, we also used a Category 5 hurricane as the kind of thing that is sort of obviously a problem, doesn't have a political leaning, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, requires assistance to whoever it is. It's not sort of um, politically uh, biased in one way or another. So we thought that those would be the closest to sort of neutral, obvious threats right, where you would want some kind of intervention. And then we thought, well, what's, what's the domestic analogy to internal political change? Well, probably protests, right? Domestic unrest, protests that, that create sort of civil unrest. But we wanted to make sure that we didn't just do protest because the people answering the survey might have very different ideas in their head of what that meant. So we specified a Black Lives Matter protest and a Reopen America protest. And remember, we did this in the summer of 2020. So we, we fielded the survey uh, end of July, beginning of August 2020. So those protests were actually happening, 
had been happening for the past month or two. So it was highly salient. And we thought, you know, people should, if they're you know, following the same track as, as the international literature, people should feel much less okay with interventions in response to these kinds of things, you know, militarized interventions. And then finally, we also, because it was happening and because there was a, a significant amount of concern, we wanted to see how they felt about interventions in a pandemic. So we asked them about that too. So number one, we think that they will care differently, that they'll feel differently about the legitimacy, the effectiveness, um, et cetera, for different instigating events. We also thought that it would vary by actor. In other words, that domestic intervention, people might have feelings about who is the more legitimate actor to do this kind of thing. So in this particular one, we did a five by four by two by two. The four, um, I can explain if you, if you need me to, the, the only three of those categories are really important uh, to your understanding of our results. We have the police, the National Guard, and the military or the active duty military. We ask those two things separately for reasons that I can explain if you want me to. But so the actors were police, National Guard, military, right? And we thought, you know, people should feel differently about who is intervening in what scenario. There we go. We also thought that it might vary by um, what type of action they're doing in terms of intervention, right? Because intervention could mean all kinds of different things. We wanted to make this fairly simple. So we just uh, made a distinction between um, logistical support. I think our wording was delivering supplies and providing transportation or an order maintenance intervention, i.e. maintaining order, um, order maintenance, maintaining order, yes. Um, coming in and stopping looting, coming in and preventing uh, people from gathering in large groups, right? That, that's an order maintenance intervention. So we thought that people might feel differently about which of those it was. And finally, that it would vary by whether the actor was armed or unarmed, for obvious reasons. But this was, again, something that was in the news a lot, right? Should the National Guard be armed if they're going to be sent in to um, respond to protests, right? Okay, so those were our hypotheses. Again, as I said, it's a conjoint survey, five by four by two by two. Um, we had a pretty uh, representative sample. It was a Qualtrics ran the survey for us. Um, the only thing uh, that we really need to note here is that the sample skewed a little bit highly educated. Um, but, you know, we, we hope that that didn't influence the results. In fact, it, you know, I mean, we can't tell whether that influenced the results, but we hope it didn't. Um, oops, there we go. So experimental design, I just went through this, right? But just so you can see it again, and I just want to point out what we have here under ACTA, and you see in, in parentheses, this was a vignette survey, right? And so we did say in the vignette who the authority was who deployed these forces. That was to sort of help people understand the context. Turns out we probably should have been more careful with that because it might have actually affected some of our outcome. Um, I'll talk about that later. but we. We said, <laughs> we said that um, if, if the military or the active duty were the ones being sent in, the vignette said that the president was sending them. If the National Guard were the ones being sent in, we specified that it was the governor sending them in, not the president. So we wanted people to not think of that as a federal intervention. Um, and then the police were sent by the mayor. Okay. Um, okay, next. There we go. Outcome variables. Um, we used a battery of variables partly because with a conjoint, you know, you want to make sure that you have sort of all of your bases covered. So we wanted to know about approval, right? Do you approve of this mission or not? That's the standard question in the international literature. So we asked both a binary, yes, no, and a scale, a Likert scale. Um, in terms of strongly approved to strongly disapprove. We asked a warmth question. This comes out, so a lot of the literature on police legitimacy comes out of sociology. And sociologists really like warmth questions um, because they, they want to know not just what you think about something, but how you feel about something. So we included this. It's actually kind of interesting. That not a lot of significance that comes out of it, but there are interesting patterns that come out of the warmth question. Effectiveness, um, two seven-point scales. One, how effective do you think this action will be? Because again, remember, 
Um, we know that in the international realm, people's expectations of effectiveness or something being successful matter a lot to whether they support it. So how effective do you think this will be? And then we also asked, do you think the actor, whatever was inserted in your vignette, do you think they'll do a good job? Um, so again, we're just trying to cover all bases. And then legitimacy, um, again, scales, legitimate to illegitimate. And we also asked appropriate to inappropriate, just in case people were thinking different things with these different terms, because sometimes in survey um, research, people use the, the term legitimate, sometimes they use appropriate. We don't know if people think those mean different things, so we asked them both. Okay, great. So main results, the US public tends to favor less intervention. Um, in general, right? Um, when intervention does occur, they prefer it not to be armed, they prefer it not to be order maintenance, and they prefer local actors over federal actors. None of this should be surprising unless it's surprising because you think, wait, um, if the police are the problem in most of these cases, why don't they prefer seeing the military? This was a theory that was out there that maybe it would be better to send in the military to deal with these protests, right? Because the police were actually part of what was being protested in some cases, not in all cases. Turns out, at least according to our respondents, they'd rather not. Okay. Um, they also generally object more to intervention in the more political types of events, which is what we expected and, and also hoped. Um, we, we didn't, uh, we, we were hoping that we did not find that Americans were like, yeah, send the military to those protests. Um, so they, they tended to like that kind of intervention much less than they liked it in a terrorist threat or a hurricane. How do you think they felt about the pandemic? Anyone? Yes or no? Good, bad, what do you think? Yes, they hated it, yeah. <laughs> uh, and this is fascinating actually. Um, Mike Robinson has done some work in Japan uh, on this, on a similar question, and the Japanese public also hated a militarized response to the pandemic. Like everyone hates militarized responses to pandemics. I don't know why. Um, but, and this is interesting, in general, so this is before we split out any sort of characteristics, in general, the public was less likely to object to armed and order maintenance responses to a Black Lives Matter protest than they were to a reopen America protest. That's interesting, we'll, we'll come back to that. Then we also did some um, tests on certain things that we were sh pretty sure would not introduce post-treatment bias. We asked people their um, partisan identity and we asked them their race and ethnicity and we figured those things would probably not change too much just because they just took a survey experiment. Um, so we feel like it's not introducing post-treatment bias to ask them these questions and do some analysis based on them. And we did find that there were some really significant differences between Republicans and Democrats on some of these issues. None of them surprising uh, if, you, if you study sort of the differences between Republicans and Democrats in the United States, right? Um, Republicans were significantly more likely to favor intervention in protests. Remember I said one of the general findings was that the general public likes that less than intervention in more traditional security threats, Republicans were more okay with it, right? Um, they were more likely to favor the use of the National Guard in general, um, as, as compared to the police baseline. We used police as the baseline. Um, they were more likely to favor order maintenance interventions and more likely to favor armed interventions, right? So pretty much all in line with what you might expect. Okay. I have a ton of these charts, they all look almost exactly the same, which is good news because it means that approval, warmth, legitimacy, um, expectations of success, etc., lined up very well. Like the correlations were extremely high. What you want to see, what, what you want to take notice of here is that, um, so you can see in general, they just don't like intervention. So uh, again, with a conjoint, what you do, you, you are not measuring absolute values with a conjoint. So we can't tell you 60% of the population likes this. We can't tell you that with a conjoint survey. What we can tell you is that if you compare it 
to, if you compare something to the baseline, which in this case we have the hurricane, the police, um, logistical support and unarmed interventions as the baselines, you can see the comparative values, but we cannot tell you in absolute terms. president thing. That's what we're guessing. We don't know because we didn't test for that. <laughs> but we'll try to find out in another project. Um, okay, and then this is effectiveness and confidence in job quality. I think this one is really interesting um, in terms of number one, nobody thinks that they'll be effective at any of these things. Right, so the, the US public has very little confidence that, that um, these solutions will work at all, right? But also interesting is that they don't seem to think that, that any of these institutions are more or less effective than one another, despite the fact that if you just sort of asked an average American, do you think the military is good at its job, they'd mostly say yes, and do you think the police are good at their job, they'd mostly say no. But um, here, the, there doesn't seem to be much difference. The only exception being confidence in job quality, we think the National Guard does a good job even though we have no idea who they are or what they do. Um. <laughs> okay, so, but again, it might just be a state response versus local or federal. We just don't, we don't know. Okay, just a couple of additional things to point out. Um, one thing that we also wanted to check on in the international relations literature, you know, the, the approval of foreign intervention literature, one of the things that is argued, right, is that if you think something is legitimate and likely to be successful, then you will approve of it. There's a sort of implied causal connection there. Um, we wanted to see if that held here. I want to point out that we found strong correlation. We have no idea which way the causal arrow runs, right? It's, uh, it's impossible to tell. We did find um, that people who felt that the people who were more likely to feel that this was legitimate, more likely to think that it was appro or appropriate, more likely to think that it would work, were also more likely to approve of it and feel warm about it, right? But uh, in a domestic context, it's really much harder to tell. Um, although, frankly, in the international context, it might all come from elite signaling as well. <laughs> um, but we thought that we should at least point out that we checked, and yes, they are highly correlated. Um, again, uh, I want to point out that the only things, well, so the respondents tended to be okay with a militarized response to a car bomb threat, right? Which makes sense, because that's the one we wanted them to be okay with. Um, one of the interesting uh, things, though, was that they were sort of okay with hurricane interventions, but not highly. Um, and they generally wanted the police, except for um, hurricanes and pandemics, in which case they wanted the National Guard. Uh, interesting. We also checked, as I mentioned, we asked questions about race and ethnicity, and we, we split this out into both black uh, as a specific category, partly because of the issues that were going on at the time, and people of color more generally. So people could self-identify into either of those. Um, and so we tested both of them. Uh, they looked very similar. 
as you might expect, but maybe not necessarily. Um, and one of the interesting things that we found, I didn't put this on a slide because the table is too big, but I, I have the appendix with me and I can you know, show it to you if you want. Black respondents and people who identify themselves as people of color were less supportive of intervention across the board than white respondents, but they didn't differ significantly from white respondents on actor preferences. In other words, we did not find um, that black respondents or uh, respondents of color significantly um, ha had a significant difference between how they felt about the police and how they felt about these other institutions, which is sort of surprising. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know what to make of that. If you have ideas, let me know. Um, but obviously uh, less supportive of order maintenance, less supportive of armed interventions. One interesting thing was that black respondents were in fact the, the only uh, type of situation where uh, black or person of color was significantly different was for the, the car bomb threat and then they were actually positively associated. Um, so black respondents wanted more of a response to terrorist threats. Um, and then, as I showed you, the public generally sees most of these interventions as ineffective. They just don't see them as, as being very likely to work. And this is, um, you know, this is interesting because they still seem to be sort of, um, it doesn't seem to affect the, their confidence in the military as an organization when you ask, so this is a broader thing, not just this project, but there is a, a fair amount of research now looking at this question of when do you think an organization is legitimate? Why do you have trust in them or confidence in them? Um, and actual performance doesn't seem to matter very much for the military. It does matter for the police though. Most of the literature on police legitimacy indicates that what matters the most for how people feel about the, not the most, but one of the things that matters a lot is whether they are seen as being procedurally legitimate. Are they seen as behaving fairly even if you don't like the outcome? Um, so that's, that's an interesting, just an interesting point. Um, I do have all, oh, so I have a bunch of regression tables if you want to look at them. I do have some more of these um, where we uh, sort of singled out specific variables. If you want to look at any of those, I can pull them up. But I'd really rather um, stop the presentation of this paper right there uh, and just tell you really quickly a little bit about sort of the broader picture in terms of projects um, that we have going on. So uh, Dr. Blankshane and I just had something published that is also a survey experiment, not a conjoint, where we look at how the public feels about costs associated with military um, operations and military deployments. And we find uh, that the, the sort of posited skin in the game mechanism, the idea that the public will care if they feel like they are going to pay a personal cost, doesn't really hold up. Um, and we think that that's uh, sort of an interesting addition to this whole question of when does the public care about these kinds of things? Because I think we tend to assume that the public cares when they are personally affected, um, but there is, a, there is a fair amount of evidence that the public that, that being personally affected doesn't necessarily have the effect that we think it does. It's complex um, and it may not matter as much as several other things going on. So that, that's one thing that we want to point out. I also mentioned that I'm, I'm currently writing a book on the domestic use of the US military for policing purposes. Um, this project really was one of the things I wanted to do because that book is aimed at trying to understand under what conditions domestic use of the military has or does not have negative civil military outcomes. Like when does this kind of use of the military make people lose trust and faith in the military? When does this kind of use of the military um, make people see it as a partisan tool? When does it make the military decide, hey, we're really good at politics, maybe we should govern this place, right? Because those are some of the outcomes in the comparative literature that are expected. So this is kind of step one. Um, in, a, in a larger set of projects for all three of us uh, as, as researchers. Um, and I just want to end with, with a plug. As I said, political scientists have done very little in the study of policing in the United States, right? Comparativists do a great job looking at security sector forces in other countries, but 
people who study the United States either as a comparative case or as Americanists um, or as, as sort of, you know, <clears throat> how domestic politics affect international relations, we tend not to study the police as an institution um, or public opinion about the police, right? It's a huge, huge area where people could really contribute because we just, um, you know, in criminology, they're interested in a different set of questions, right? In sociology, they're interested in a different set of questions. So if you are a graduate student looking for something to think about, start thinking about police. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you. So the, the floor is open for questions. Uh, as is our norm, when we have some new members of uh, the seminar, uh, I'll keep a running list, but I do ask everyone to sort of raise their hands in the beginning. And if uh, you want to jump in later, just grab my eye somehow, and um, I'll, I'll, um, I'll add you to the list. So this is now the time to raise your hand. Keep them high till I see them. Rich, we're going to start with you since you're right here. Uh, everyone else, keep your hands up. Hi, Rich Nielsen. Hi. Um, uh, I'm wondering uh, how much you expect, I don't think your survey can answer this, but uh, what your gut sense is, how much you expect that some of these responses just follow what people see in the news? So basically people become habituated to seeing certain actors named in certain situations, and in, especially with the National Guard, they may have less of a sense of what the National Guard does, they just know that the National Guard gets called out, whatever that means, or called up, or some phrasing in certain circumstances, and they're trying to report back to you what they believe the correct answer is about those circumstances. I mean, the conjoint means that they're not like reporting back in that way, um, but but I still just wonder, like, if if these actors started getting used by politicians in a different way, would preferences in your uh, reveal preferences in your survey, then change to follow like what is, what's actually happening uh, on the ground. Well, I, I mean, I think the answer is probably yes. Uh, I think, especially when people know very little about what's going on or think it's unusual, they will absolutely follow cues. Um, I don't think that that's necessarily a problem for our results here. Unless, unless you want to interpret these results as somehow being universal, whereas we kind of take them as an indication, an indication of, um, you know, how people felt during a particular time. I mean, we, one of the reasons we thought that this would be a good time to do it would be because this was very salient, because it was in the news, because people were seeing the National Guard might be mobilized and we wanted them to report back to us how they felt about that, right? Um, if we had done this survey at some point in time when nothing was going on, I feel like we would have gotten um, like nothing. I don't think anyone would have had strong feelings about anything. Um, but I do think that let's say circumstances shifted and a different set of protests were happening, a different, a different administration in place using different actors, I think, yes, you would probably see um, some significant differences. And uh, that's why I think people should keep studying. I'll, I saw a two finger. Yeah. Is this also your one finger? Yeah. Or is it, OK, great. Also, I, I guess I, I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly when the survey was fielded, but was it around the time of that incident um, during the Black Lives Matter protest when Trump went out in front of the church with the military Lafayette officers. Square. Um, yeah. Does anyone remember what the date of Lafayette Square was? June? Early June. Yeah, it was June. So that was before we fielded. We fielded um, the survey in the end of July, beginning of August. So it was before January 6th, right? So before January 6th, it, at the height of um, Black Lives Matter and Reopen America protests, um, but yes, post Lafayette Square. Okay, yeah, the only reason I brought that up is because I sort of remember that as like one time that I suddenly heard like a lot about civil military relations in the news where like I probably hadn't heard about it at all. And so I imagine it was like a super salient time and it's like a good example of like a botched use of military for domestic use of things, so. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, Renata. Yes, hi. Thanks for this uh, really, really interesting presentation. Um, 
I, I had so you know my my biggest comments on question you already addressed head on right which was which was the the question of whether this apparent preference for local intervention is actually being driven by associations with who's president at the time um, yeah. sending to e either the individual or the office right you know we don't hey, we don't need the president sort of getting into our, our business here but we, we will defer to the governor and mayor and so um and so i want this is the, the problem with doing these survey experiments is people always sort of want you to do something else but but i wonder whether you have considered two two possibilities one being running the exact same i'm doing uh now right where you have you know the same questions the same vignettes you just have different actors and see whether that actually shifts at all or whether you consider to running the same the exact same hundred but without specifying the, the spending authority um and then the, the second just a related question on on the um the traditional security threats um, I was just wondering, do, do you specify in the vignette uh, the, the origin of the terrorist attacks? This, so, so people could be interpreting this as like domestic right wing terrorism. We just say there's a call bomb threat. Yeah. So they they are free to interpret that as they like in terms of who is likely to be doing that. Um, sorry, Renana, to to answer your other question, um, was this just driven by? So yeah, I mean, exactly. We that's one thing that we cannot tell and yes we we would really like to run it again exactly the same again with a different president and see how that changes things i mean um yeah that you know we we have some really interesting research on how republicans and democrats differ in terms of how they respond to um or in terms of how their feelings about institutions change depending on who's in office uh, so we we are fairly confident that it would matter. We just don't know how much. So we would love to do another one if anyone just happens to have bags of money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bag, and I have about twenty five. <laughs> um, next up, let's see, Sam. I'm yeah, uh, Samuel Layer, third year PhD student. Thanks so much for this talk. Um, I'm kind of curious about whether or not there is. Any observable implication of sort of higher severity threats, I suppose, posed by the events, triggering more support for military or higher levels of for National Guard intervention. Um, I was also curious whether or not you know you could look at the partisanship of the respondent and a governor or mayor in the state they're responding from, if you have that information, or whether or not whether or not that's impacting in any way support for National Guard or police intervention. Oh, that would be lovely. Okay. If we could do that. Um, we can't do it with the data we collected. We just asked them regional origin. We did not ask them state. Um, and we would need county level stuff for police. Um, we don't have that. But you're right, it would be brilliant people who need a project. Um, yeah, the observable implications of high level security threats. Um, that's a great question. I think one of the reasons that we used what we used was precisely because um we we wanted to try and make them things that were squishily equivalent um you know a car bomb threat might kill people it might kill a fair number of people but it's not going to kill a huge number of people um, but people tend to feel that terrorist threats are more significant than something like a pandemic so you know we we tried to we didn't explicitly um, try to measure in any way how threatening people felt these things were? That's a good question. Um, and it's possible that people were perceiving them very differently, but the one of the reasons that a conjoint was a nice way to do this is because these things are randomized, right? The treatments are randomized. Um, so in theory, if you had sort of systematically different expectations about what what levels of threat there were, these scenarios would have been randomized across those groups of people. So hopefully that would even out. Is that we didn't do what you want, but it's not that bad. <laughs> um, great, thanks. Uh, let's see. Is that Anne in the back? Yeah, Anne. I have two quick questions. The first question 
And secondly, um, this is kind of a methodological question, but you mentioned that you oversampled educated people. And I'm wondering whether you look at differences by education in an attempt to see whether that makes any difference or. So um, I'll t the agenda question first. We, uh, we did not separate that out. Um, uh, we might be able to. Uh, Danny, if you're watching, um, you can, <laughs> we, can, we might be able to do that. I, we, I know we didn't. That's not one of the things we looked at. Um, but um, then the, the, the other question about education. Um, I don't know if we could do that. Um, and we didn't mean to oversample an education. But <laughs> yeah. I would think you would be. Like, it sounds like you have that data. That's how you know that you oversampled. Right. So, so again, I know we didn't do that particular test. Um, I'm not sure whether we could. Again, the same answer as as uh, Sam. I think yes. Same answer as with Sam. The the hope is that. Um, those kinds of things will be controlled for through the randomization of the treatment, right? That's the hope. Um, whether, uh, whether more educated people behave differently than others, though, I cannot tell you. Yeah, but I think you should be able to. I mean, based on, based on the data you have, I think you should be able to. Okay. Yeah. We'll try that. Great. Let's see. Um, Right, you were next on my list. I also saw that you had two fingers, so uh, you may have your, you, you, you may have both fingers now. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, uh, Brian Smith, fourth year PhD student. So I, I had a question also about the sample and the education issue. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you have any, any way to map kind of education level onto reported partisanship, since it seems like this a big story of American politics of the last for eight years has been educational polarization. And so I would be curious, similarly, if there's information that's being missed if by oversampling um, educated individuals, and if there's some way to account for that in the data that you have. Uh, I mean, it's certainly possible, but we do have also data on the partisan ID of the sample, and it's actually pretty pretty good in terms of representativeness. So the fact that we are oversampled on highly educated people isn't because we're oversampled on Democrats. Does that make sense? I, I guess what my understanding, I'm not an Americanist, so I might not speak too well, but my understanding is that educated people who previously may have identified as moderate or Republican are increasingly voting Democratic without necessarily updating their partisan ID, and the same is going on the other direction that people who are part of IDs as Democrats are voting as Republican. I mean, that's possible, but then now data wouldn't help us with that, right? right. Yeah, so um, I, I just, we don't know. That's not one we can answer. Again, projects. Thank you. Let's see. Um, next, uh, Suzanne Freeman. Hi, my question might also be something else that I guess but I can't do. <laughs> yeah, I guess in the broader research agenda, um, do you at all ever think about sort of police and budgets in the same way that you think about sort of military operation and costs? That there seems to be a mismatch between sort of the like defund the police idea and this idea that the police we would like to send them into intervention. And obviously, sort of like the literature about American voters, we know that American voters aren't ideologically or budgetarily constrained in their voting preferences. And is this just an example of that, or have you thought at all about sort of asking about budgetary preferences with respect to police? I mean, the short answer to that is no, I hadn't thought about that. That's a great question. The, um, the issue of like, is it, a dis is it sort of um, problematic that people, that some people want to defund the police and some people responding to our survey also say they want the police to respond to things? I don't think that, I don't think that that's, something that we can say as a result of this, because um, again, it's a conjoint, which means I can't tell you that this many people want to send the police to do these things. All I can tell you is that they'd rather, if, if they had to, they'd rather send the police than these people. 
right? Um, so it, those are those are two different things, and um, I, I just I don't think that. I don't think we can conclude from this study that there's some kind of discrepancy going on in public opinion or some disconnect there. There may be, but we can't tell from this. Um, but that, that is a great question in terms of how the public feels about budgets for the police and how the public feels about using the police. Um, again, there isn't a lot of research on this from a political science point of view. And that's the kind of question that a polit political scientist would ask. So. Um, I, I don't think we know the answer to that. It's a great question. Um, Nick Acker. Hi, Dr. Cohn. Uh, my name is Nick Acker. I'm a fourth year PhD student as well. Um, and similarly to you, I also breathed a sigh of relief when I saw your results that most Americans did not favor their own oppression. Um, but one thing that really stood out to me was this ambivalence you've observed, particularly when it comes to the BLM movement, where on the one hand, you have protesters who are protesting police action, but are also in favor of sending in armed actors and prefer preferably police, right, to... I'm not sure they're the same people. people. Right, right. <laughs> well, but that was the other thing I was curious about, was that you said your sample had also skewed uh, over-educated. It was puzzling to me because one way I read that was thinking that most people tend to maybe skew literal, liberal or have a better understanding of structural racism, racism and these other issues. So I guess my question is, what do you think is responsible for this ambivalence? And second, we know that in sort of US foreign, or in US national identity, we have this strange balancing act between saying that we're the most consolidated, dedicated state with strong institutions, but on the other hand, right, we have this fear of government authority that's been persistent. So do your results say anything about where most Americans think about that line? Oh my goodness. Uh, wait, let me think through this question. Um, so, um, I, I again, I do not think that it's the same people who are at BLM protests and, and saying defund the police and saying on our survey, actually, we're kind of okay with the police going in. I, I, the, um, you know, again, that we asked it during a time when this would be salient in the news, um, but the likelihood that we were actually sampling, I mean, the, the percentage of the population that actually gets activist is very, very small, right? So um, I, I wouldn't necessarily draw that conclusion. But in terms of um, this sort of ambiguity, I'm actually, one of the books that I'm reading right now is um, <clears throat> Alexander's book on the, the sources of democratic consolidation, um, which is extremely depressing. But um, yeah, th this, this issue of how do Americans feel about their own democracy and about sort of the role of coercive force in society. Um, like I said, I think that we don't, we, we know some things from, when I say we know, you know what I mean. We think based on things that we've done that we hope are useful and accurate. We don't actually know these things, but we think that um, the, the commitment of the public to democratic institutions is declining. That's true across countries. Um, the trust in institutions is declining. That's true across countries. Um, ideas about uh, rule by strong men, uh, the acceptance of those ideas is increasing. Um, so I think we, we definitely have reasons to worry and that's actually one of the things we were worried about when we did this was that we were going to find sort of confirmation of some of these, like the, the public is becoming more um, accepting of sort of strong arm tactics. Um, to be honest, we can't tell you if they're becoming more accepting of them. They may be, you know, if we had done this survey 10 years ago, they may have been like, ah. Um, so I, we don't know whether it's changing in a, in a trend line. Um, but yeah, I, that's an excellent question. I will. Ha I can't answer that right now. I will have to think about that. Thank you. Remo, is this a, a two finger or a one finger? Just trying to get my attention. I, I, I don't know if I'm on the list or not. You're on the list. So, then, then, then. well, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for a good talk. Uh, Raymond Wang, uh, was here. Um, I guess I have one clarifying question. The, the clarifying question for you is like, what's the baseline for effectiveness? I can give us that. Uh, what like what what combo was the baseline for effectiveness? Um, 
And the actual question is a question about support. So like, basically, do all combinations of treatment actually have empirical, at least one empirical, empirical case? Um, I know this is a very common question for quantum experiments, but it, it seems to me that certain combos would be, uh, at least off the top of my head, I can't think of like an empirical case for it. Uh, and relatedly, there seems to be, and this kind of gets at what um, Rich is earlier question, there seems to be sort of preconceived notions of like what actor has the appropriate, what missions are appropriate for certain types of actors. I'm wondering if there's any way to capture that sort of prior belief about appropriate mission um, sets uh, into like the content experiment. Awesome, okay. Um, the baseline categories were the same for every question that we showed you. So hurricane, police, uh, logistic support, and unarmed. So the baseline categories were all the same. If, if you're asking us what the baseline would be for something being effective versus not being effective, we did not do that. We just asked people, do you think this will be effective? So it was their own ideas of what that meant. We didn't clarify, uh, or we didn't give that to them. We didn't prompt them with that. Um, empirical cases. Gosh, um, you're going to make me do this off the top of my head. Um, I'm not going to do it off the top of my head. The, um, I mean, at least in theory, even if I couldn't come up with an actual example, I don't think any of them are absurd, right? Um, you can imagine, uh, you can imagine any of these actors being sent in to deal with, uh, with a terrorist threat, depending on sort of where it was who it was, what it was threatening, et cetera. You can sort of imagine any of them needing to respond to a hurricane, I mean, that, that has actually happened. Um, you can imagine any or all of them needing to respond to a pandemic. We were looking at headlines, speculating about maybe needing to do that. Um, one of, the, one of the, the things that got me interested in this whole topic to begin with was back in the, the early 2000s when I can't remember whether it was the bird flu or the swine flu was sort of rampaging and everyone was terrified that it was going to hop to the human population and cause a horrible pandemic. And President Bush made a very offhand comment about how he would just use the military to quarantine towns if he needed to. And everyone just went nuts. Um, you know, so it is something that has been contemplated. Um, uh, and then the protests, again, like even if we didn't see it actually used, it was certainly there was certainly talk about maybe possibly using the active duty certainly was the national guard was used so um there may not in fact be empirical examples of every single one of these but i don't think any of them are absurd i mean if you think they are go ahead do you think they're absurd okay <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm Nina Miller, I'm a savior. Um, and so I was struck by, as you were describing the five sort of different scenarios, terror, hurricane, BLM, an American pandemic, that three of them were actively occurring and two of them were hypothetical. Mm -hmm. um, the sort of thing that you said were sort of deliberately constructed to be kind of squishy to evoke things that have maybe happened before. And so I'm curious, but like, as you were constructing the survey or as you were thinking about how to interpret the results, um, if you were worried about this difference between like the gap between real currently occurring and hypothetical, because one thing I was struck by looking at the results is that it seems like people oppose like current uses, real, tangible uses, but they're kind of supportive of the hypothetical ones, like yeah, if I was hit by a hurricane, maybe I'd like someone to help me out. Um, and so yeah, curious how you thought about that. Yeah, that's a really good question. We uh, So the hurricane one may not have been actually happening, but we did this survey right at the beginning of hurricane season. So people were, in fact, anticipating hurricanes, which is one of the reasons we did it as a category. So the only one that was really, truly hypothetical was the car bomb. And yeah, we had a horrible time coming up with a good traditional security threat that wasn't like, you know, nuclear threat. Like we, 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 we worked really hard to come up with something that was sort of on the same scale as the others, but it, it was going to be hypothetical. We couldn't come up with anything better than that. And I think you're absolutely right that people are, in general, um, more likely to be critical of things that, that they are actually experiencing or seeing on the news uh, and less critical of things that are simply hypothetical. I think that's absolutely true. If, um, 
But to be to be fair, if, if we did it again, I don't know if we could come up with a better. If, if anyone has a better threat, um, tell me. We're not going to use it because we're going to run the same, <laughs> the same experiment. But if we do another one, we might we might use your idea. C can I just answer his last question real quick? Okay. Um, preconceptions about what missions are appropriate. We believe people have these preconceptions. We don't know what they are. So that was part of what the survey was for, was to try to find out, right? Do you think this is an appropriate mission for this organization to do? Because we simply don't know. I mean, we have, you know, I can talk to my, to my buddies and say, like, do you think this is the kind of thing the military should be doing? If you talk to a military buddy, they're gonna be like, no. Is it legal to use them that way? Yes. So, you know, we don't know what those preconceptions are. And so this was one of the ways that we wanted to try to ask that question, because I think it, you're right, it's very important. Apropos this point about um, people being skeptical of ongoing things, I know the 2004 is practically medieval history in terms of public opinion, but during Katrina, um, the perception of the military and the National Guard in particular went up through the roof when it was so clear that they brought um, a humane order to absolute chaos in New Orleans and that nobody else could, was capable of doing it. That seems to cut the other direction. So much. Because this is one of the things that inspired, not Katrina specifically, but one of the things that inspired my whole book project uh, was the fact that the fear that you hear from so many people, um, people in my community, my sort of little civil military relations world, and, and many in the military as well, practitioners, um, fear that if you use the military for domestic interventions, where they might be put in awkward situations, where they might have to do order maintenance, um, that the public will turn on them. And this does happen in certain countries, in certain circumstances, etc. But there's very little evidence of it in the US context. Generally, when the military, the, the active duty forces have been used under certain circumstances in the US, the public has responded by liking them more. There are exceptions to this, Reconstruction being one of them, and the Civil Rights era being the other. And Kent State. Well, Kent State was the National Guard. Um, again, not that anyone understands the difference, but uh, <laughs> it is. Um, but Kent State was the National Guard. It was not the active duty forces. Uh, and um, yeah, so, so there, there, and yes, civil rights era, right? So there are times and conditions under which use of the military for domestic intervention makes the public dislike them. But in general, um, in general, the, the trend is actually that the public, the, the visibility, the helping, um, the perception of them as being competent and effective vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, the, the local police forces especially at the time. Especially logistical issues. Especially logistical issues. That. Right, exactly. So, so there's actually um, you know, more danger of what you know, Alexander Hamilton said was the problem way back in the Federalist Papers when he's like, you know what'll happen if we have a standing army and we use them for all kinds of things, people will start thinking, hey, these guys are fantastic. Maybe we should just let them run everything. That's a direct quote. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it, in the US history, that has been more often the case than the other way around. Yes. Yeah, yeah did you have a, another question as well, or did you? No. That was a okay. Um, Josh? Hey, Lindsay, congrats on a great project. Oh, great timely. Um, my question is whether you control for the political identification of the governor or the president in your scenario. Just because like, one concern could be if response is soon that some of the conditions the, the governor becomes Republican and others that Democrat that could be mostly right some of the results rather than the and stuff like that. Um, no, we didn't. And and I don't think given the circumstances, I don't think there's any way we could have. Um, but uh, the again, as as in response to I think Renana's question, um, what we'd like to do is do it again, 
right? And that would be a sort of way of seeing how much a difference in administration matters. Now, you know, for many people, the governor of their state is, is always of one party or the other. There aren't a whole lot of states where that flips back and forth a lot. Um, so in a sense, um, you know, we can't ask people, if you lived in a different state, would you then be okay with the governor sending <laughs> uh, but, uh, but no, we could not control for that. But we hope to do it again, and that would help allay that concern, because it is a concern, as several people have pointed out. Yeah. Vice versa, that for Republican did that for the America protests or something similar like that. You can imagine not put Google on how nice it is. I think that's an interesting idea. I think that runs into the problem of believability of the scenario, right? Um, then you start getting into like, would a Democratic president do that? You know, I don't know. Um, but I, I'm afraid that the respondents might start thinking, so I, because in surveys, many of you probably know this, once the, once the respondent starts thinking, I'm not sure if this is a very good survey, they sort of stop taking the survey. <laughs> So at least that's how I respond to bad surveys. Maybe that's just me. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, next time, uh, Ky Kylie? Hi, Kaylee. Kaylee, Kaylee sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Statecraft postdoc fellow. Um, my question actually builds kind of on Josh's and Ramana's earlier question, but it's less about the identity of the actor and more about the office. So I'm wondering sort of what implications um, this project would maybe also project the identity of the, of the office that is sending the respective institution has. And I guess I was particularly thinking of the reminding that Republicans tend to favor the National Guard, which was sent by the governor. I'm wondering if perhaps maybe there's a state's rights sort of leaning there um, potentially. Um, but I just sort of wonder more, more broadly what's, what implications um, the identity of the elite who is sending in the uh, institution might have for this project. But, um, as you may have noticed, I did not have a slide saying implications because we are still working on that. So um, yeah, this is a this is a great question. Is what um, what does it mean for policy, for research, um, uh, go, for for democracy going forward? What does any of this mean? Um, we haven't really sort of worked through and, and polished what we think about those things yet. But I do, I think your intuition about sort of um, the federal versus state level and Republicans liking local governance more than federal government, I, I think that's absolutely right. Again, in the book project, um, a lot of the story turns out to be a federalism story um, in, in multiple ways. In fact, mostly it's about getting the federal government to pay for things the states don't want to pay for. Uh, so. National Guard, again. <laughs> um, so what other implications uh, could this have? I mean, I don't know. I just don't know. If you have great ideas, feel free to send them along. Um, because I think it's, uh, it definitely implies that, um, that there is a, a sort of divide in the population about whom they see as more legitimate. Uh, and if that is systematic, then, then that has a lot of important implications for sort of how to, it, jumping to the question of how do we reconsolidate American democracy, going back to, um, sorry, I've forgotten your name right here, Nick. Nick, going back to your point, if we jump to the big question of like, what do we do to reconsolidate American democracy, the US democracy, um, you know, if what we are finding is that there are significant systematic differences in who finds which institutions legitimate, and we do know, we already know that, right? But in terms of sort of domestic order maintenance and response to domestic unrest, ooh, that is, that's scary. So, yeah. Next, uh, Phil Hunt. Lindsay, great project. 
Are you allowed uh, to ask me questions? I am. I'm going to ask you a question. But I've been asking the different types of questions. You're getting graded. <laughs> so uh, I, I have a, I, I want to ask a question for somebody who doesn't do survey experiments or somebody who's considering doing survey experiments. What practical advice you would give in terms of how much does one of these things cost? How much time does it take? What kind of uh, learning curve is involved? What's the risk of failure? Uh, what, what advice would you give to grad students who are thinking about doing these type of survey experiments? No, that's actually, uh, that's a great question. So, um, depending on how big the, su the survey sample is and how um, professionally you want it done, um, it's going to cost, uh, you know, I would say in the realm of $2,000 to $5,000 to do something. It's not a huge amount of money, but it is definitely more than pocket change. Um, and you want to get it done. Not according to my plumber. <laughs> <laughs> And you do want to get it done as professionally as possible. Um, there is a fair amount of research out there on what types of survey mechanisms are reliable versus less reliable. Um, you know, and there are so many of these sort of pay people to take, you know, pay people a couple of cents to take little surveys. What I would recommend is if you are thinking of doing survey research, do a pilot using something like MTurk, right? Do a plausibility probe. It's very cheap. You can, you can do it very easily and you can do it yourself, but don't use that, don't try to get that published. <laughs> um, do a plausibility probe, see if, you know, kind of work out question wording, work out whether there's any there, there, um, do it cheaply and then go find, you know, once you have uh, a survey instrument that you think is actually pretty good, um, once you think that there is something to be found, then go look for some money. Again, you're looking for a few thousand dollars. Um, if you want to do a decent survey sample, I mean, if you want to do like 10,000 people, you're going to need a lot more money. Um, but to be frank, nobody needs 10,000 people in the survey. Um, but you need, you know, at least 1,000, 1,200 um, to, to be sort of really, um, really convincing to people. Um, so that's how much it costs. How much time does it take? So um, it depends on, I mean, it depends on how, how good you are at de designing surveys, but assuming that you've designed the survey instrument um, and you've got some company doing it for you, and there, there are companies that do this, right? There's Qualtrics, there's YouGov, there are a couple of others that are just not coming to me right now, but you, what you want to do is find uh, a company that does this professionally and get them to run a survey for you. Um, or if you know someone else who is doing survey research, you can ask to add some questions into their survey. If you just have a couple of things you want to know and somebody does regular survey research, you don't have to run your own. Just find somebody who's, who's doing a survey already um, and insert some questions. But in terms of how long it takes, um, the, so our survey, this one was run for a couple of weeks. So the survey was out for a few weeks. We got results back almost immediately, and then the real time suck is us trying to run through and clean the data. Um, so you can think of this from sort of beginning of designing the instrument, right? So a lot of conceptual work has to go into it first, so I'm not counting that. But from sort of designing the instrument to having sort of data that you can do something with, I mean, you could do it in six months. It might take longer than that, but you could do it in six months, I would say. Um, I don't know. If anyone here is like, you're totally wrong about that. Um, oh, oh, IRB. Oh, IRB. Um, yes. So, a um, couple of things. Number one, uh, in order to make it go nice and smoothly through IRB, you want to try to avoid deception. Right, so try not to, and this is, <laughs> why is that funny? <laughs> um, yeah, you don't want to tell people that things are happening when they're not. This is sometimes a problem for doing survey research, but you really shouldn't do it. Um, 
both for ethical reasons and because the IRB is going to hold on to your application much longer. Um, one thing, oh, this is actually, thank you, Kelly, for saying that, because this, um, this happened to us. We wanted to know, so one of the, one of the sort of control questions we asked, well, well, two of them, were, have you or anyone in your family ever served in the military or as a police officer, right? We wanted to, to ask that and, and make sure that we were not, you know, somehow oversampling former police officers, because um, they would all be like, yeah. Um, but uh, we wanted to ask that, and we did ask that. We also wanted to ask, have you ever experienced police violence? Because we thought that that might matter, right? The IRB told us we couldn't ask that question. So we had to take it out. Um, so excellent point, Kelly. Yeah, so anything that could um, re-traumatize a traumatized person, anything that could cause someone to reveal information Rusty uh, action feed over the summer. Uh, Barry? So I don't do this kind of work at all and work through it pretty quickly, so if I missed anything or maybe much of it, you just tell us. Um, so I would try to pull out of this some more general kinds of inferences. And uh, I guess um, I, I was wondering about the following. In other words, you say are you, you're, you're, you're examining sort of more than less, because people's people are on some sort of dial. But so they prefer, you know, local to national. They prefer um, uh, aided floods to Billy clubs. They, they, they prefer all that. But it seems like you also saw that they actually don't think that any level of government can do anything right. Is that correct? Yes, we, we found that they did not think that any of those actors would be particularly effective at any of those interventions compared to a hurricane. Compared to a hurricane. Right, compared to, yes. So again, compared. To a compared. That's right. So the baseline is how effective do you think they'll be at responding to a hurricane? And we think they'll be less effective at everything else. So we don't know how effective they think they will be in an absolute sense. That is correct. Okay. And then I guess my, my second question is, um, you, know, you asked the question, got the answer from the group, not the National Guard, who knows what the National Guard is. But does your 
survey data actually suggests that people sort of do know what the National Guard is? I mean, they sort of know the governor controls it. They sort of know it's trotted out to do natural disaster relief. They sort of know it's local, right? And they may, for all we know, be more likely to know someone in the National Guard than in the regular army of Europe, because I don't know if that's true, but it seems more likely to be. Right? So, on the one hand, you say they don't know who the Guard is, and on the other hand, it seems like they do. And what, 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 what do you make of that? Yeah, uh, this is one of our big conundrums. Um, and the, the simple answer to your question is, these are two different surveys. Um, and so, you know, the fact that we are finding in one survey that when you ask people, do you know, or when, when you ask people, I'm trying to remember exactly the wording of the survey of the other project. Um, when you ask people questions about who the National Guard are, like, I know that we asked them a question about, like, uh, do you think the National Guard is A, um, this kind of organization, B, this kind of organization, C, this kind of organization? They're mostly wrong. When, when they answer, so it's knowledge questions. Yeah. So when you ask people knowledge questions about the National Guard, they get most of them wrong. But you're right. This survey indicates that they kind of have the, according to people like us, the right idea about the National Guard. Um, as I said, one of our speculations is that they're responding not to the National Guard queue, but to the governor queue. That's possible. Because um, that's a queue, right? We, we didn't we didn't vary it randomly. We, we added it to the vignette to sort of make it sound like a more plausible story. Um, but uh, it's possible that that's the cue they're responding to. It's, it's also possible that people have a vague understanding back to the sort of original question about um, uh, the original question about the media framing that, that people have a sort of general idea that when disasters happen, the National Guard comes out. Um, and, and that that seems okay and good. So the, this idea of the role conception being there, right? This idea of the, the appropriate role conception. Um, but that when you ask them more specific stuff, uh, like are they a reserve component of the armed forces? Are they a part-time, are they part-time soldiers? You know, things like that. They, they may not, they may just not know specific stuff. Um, so I think it's something that we need to sort of tease out more in terms of like who, who does the public think the National Guard are? And Dr. Blankshane has done a lot of really interesting work on this. She has a great chapter looking at how the National Guard has been transformed from a strategic reserve into an operational reserve and sort of um, how who's in the National Guard has transformed over time to look much more like the active component. Like who the National Guard is is very different now than they were during Vietnam, for example. Um, so the, there's a huge amount of information that we don't know about how the, the public thinks about the National Guard, who they think they are, what the connections are, because the National Guard is supposed to be that bridge, but um, as they become more like the active component, they're becoming less like that bridge. They spend much more time on active duty now than they used to. They are deployed much more than they used to be. Um, and to, to the average small town person, for whom 40 years ago, the National Guard guy may have been someone that they knew went off for a weekend or two, um, they may never see that person now. So um, I think we just don't know. Uh, and, and what the information that we have is inconsistent and or we, need to, we need to find out more. Awesome. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Austin, I'm uh, one of the postdocs here. Um, and I have a question. I have, I have like a suite of questions. Oh. That, and, um, and I'm going to try to, you know, put them together, but they, they really have less to do with like, the data and me more trying to figure out what this tells us about, you know, the, the function of, of state power in a democracy um, and civil military relations. So I think. I'm struck by this hurricane example because it seems to me as though the hurricane example is certainly in degree different than the others. I wouldn't contest that we're talking about the use of state power, 
But it seems to me that the function of the National Guard and or the military in disaster response is primarily not repressive. It's not a repressive use of power. It's primarily you know, a supportive use of power distributing, I mean, there's order functions, but they're like distributing goods, blah, blah, blah. One of my questions, I suppose, is if we're concerned about what Alexander Hamilton said, right, about the public becoming too enamored with their military leaders, why do we have the military provide supportive response during a natural disaster? And, you know, I think that leads me to another question, which is sort of about the categories here um, having to do with this, you know, repressive supportive dichotomy and the civil military dichotomy. Do you think, to, to what extent do you think the militarization of the police is relevant here? Um, I, I'm basically asking questions about how well these fundamental categories hold up um, and, and whether or not perhaps you know, there, there are other ways of thinking about why the public might perceive some of these scenarios as different from, from other scenarios, particularly having to do with the way that state power gets enacted. Right in in these instantiations, it's not like who's doing it; it's what they're doing. So excellent, excellent questions. Um, let me start with the last one first. How do these categories hold up? Uh, and I'm glad you asked this because Erica De Bruin, who um, is at Hamilton, is working with Risa Brooks on uh, a new project that is trying to typologize security sector forces precisely because. The things that we call militaries and the things that we call police forces and, and other types of security uh, sector actors um, are often not as, not as empirically distinguishable as we think those categories are, right? Um, in fact, you know, in lots of countries, the, the police look more like a military than like a police, whatever those things mean. Um, the military might look more like, a, so you, you see what I'm saying? How do those categories hold up? Not well. Um, it's one of the things that I think uh, Risa and Erica are trying to work out is why do we think of some organizations as police and some as military, especially if you know anything about the history of policing, um, policing as an institute, uh, uh, police as an institution uh, only emerged in, in the last couple hundred years. Um, and all of law enforcement used to be a primarily uh, private function. Um, and when it got really bad, then you called in the army. And that was it. That was law enforcement, right? So the, the whole idea of policing as a civilian government function, as a public service, is fairly recent. I mean, recent if you're a historian, not recent if you're a political scientist. But um, so yeah, the categories question is a really good one. Um, we kind of pretended that wasn't a problem for us when we did this survey, but what, we are trying to get at it in the sense of like, what do people think about these things, right? So what, what Risa and Erica are doing is more um, material, like um, empirical, you know, how much, what, what equipment do they have? How much money do they have? Um, what kind of training do they have? What we were looking at was more, how does the public think about them? What do they, what do they think they're supposed to do? right these different types of organizations so that's that's your categories thing which is an excellent point um to what extent is the militarization of the police relevant oh again my book uh, <laughs> um this is a very fraught question um but i think it is important to recognize and and one of the implications that this study maybe has is that militarization of the police is uh, not the direction that the US public wants to see things go, right? I, there, there is a segment of the public that um, appreciates it. Uh, the police certainly like it because it makes them feel safer. It makes them feel more effective. There is no evidence that it actually makes them more effective. There is evidence that it makes them less effective at certain things. Um, but there, there are certain, I, I would say politically, groups that favor uh, what, what we can loosely call the militarization of the police, which can mean a lot of different things. Um, but the general public doesn't seem to like it, right? 
Um, the more the police become militarized, however, the, the more we might expect, if we keep doing this survey over and over again, the more we might expect those categories to converge, but we don't know the answer to that yet. Maybe not. Maybe people will continue to think of them as totally separate things, even if operationally they look the same. We don't know. That's a, that, that's, we'll have to find out. Um, why do we have the military provide supportive response during natural disaster? Okay, this is, um, I'll give you the simple, easy answer because we're almost out of time. The simple, easy answer is a couple of things. Number one, um, the US government and the US population don't like to fund civilian organizations. Um, they don't like to fund organizations that do sort of aid and structure. I mean, the whole infrastructure thing has been sort of an example of like, in general, the public is not really happy about having their tax dollars used for these things. I, I mean, you know, they're not against it necessarily, but, but it's harder to get things like that through Congress. So a lot of the institutions, the civilian institutions that should do disaster response and that are, um, you know, uh, tasked with disaster response do not have the logistical capability that the military has, do not have the um, organizational capacity that the military has, the ability to do things quickly and in an organized way. So basically, we've built this enormous standing military that's really good at stuff, and we pay a lot of money for it, and we're like, hey, we have this, um, let's, you know, and we have a hurricane, let's send the people who are ready right now and can do a really good job. Um, you know, so, and this is true across countries, right? The US is not unique in this, in this sense, Latin America, uses its military, Latin America, as though it's a, a place. Um, Latin American states use their militaries for these kinds of things in, in, for almost exactly the same reasons, right? The military has more funding, the military has more organizational capacity, the military um, can, can get these things done. Whereas if you uh, try to, I mean, they, they have the militaries, what, painting schools? We have the National Guard driving school buses. Why is that? Because we won't, pay school bus drivers, I guess, but, but we as different people here, right? Who's paying the National Guard for this? In, in some cases, the state, in some cases, the federal government. Who would pay the school bus drivers? The local school district. All right, so it, it, most of it comes back to the money. It's all about the money. Well, uh, right on time. Uh, thank you so much, Lindsay, for a terrific presentation. <laughs> Thank you.